First Avenue and the East River. Good morning. Good evening, everyone from around the world. My name is Gligor Toskovich. I'm the former Minister for Foreign Investment of the Republic of a country now called North Macedonia. And this is a Harasses Global Summit. Uh, this is a panel on actions that define a democracy and being democratic. Uh, and the opening statement the organizers have asked us to read uh, is as follows. A simple view of a democracy would be one or more parties in opposition to the ruling party where all can debate freely. In Russia, with effectively a single ruler for over 21 years, most media outlets are now banned or under strong controls following its invasion of the Republic of Ukraine. Over in the USA, in what is arguably the globe's most powerful nation with a substantial media industry, there is an embedded two-party system, always sometimes in fierce opposition with each other. How should we define a good working democracy? And more importantly, how should this be achieved? Our panelists today are the former president of Ecuador, Her Excellency Rosalia Ortega Serrano, Andrew McGregor, director and founder of Umbelt Research in Los Angeles, Charles Tang, the president of the Brazil Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Brazil, currently at the airport in Sao Paulo, Alec Wang, founder and president of Tana Investment Group in San Francisco, and Samantha Zirkin, executive director, Cross Border Civilians Foundations USA. So to begin, um, Madam President, would you like to make an opening remark? Thank you, and uh, good uh, morning or, or good evening in different parts of the world. Uh, I am happy to be here in this panel and to talk about the democracy. Uh, when we think about uh, the origin of democracy, the Western democracy, we need to, to, to think about three elections that define democracy the division between the powers and the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary powers, and also freedom, freedom especially of expression. Uh, when we analyze what's happening in the world, it is true that in many college democracy, we don't have all these um, uh, situations that make us uh, um, possible to call it a real democracy. Is kind of noise that you can delete? Yes, Mr. Tang, can you mute yourself, please? If I'm someone sorry. Uh, close the, yeah. There oh, we go. thank you. Yeah, it was the, the airport, I think. Yes, I was feeling the, this noise. Well, I, I, I uh, make an, uh, a comment about how we can uh, conceive and, and, and think about democracy and we are talking about uh, western democracy when i have meetings with uh, people of other parts of the world um for example for example in the library of alexandria or on at the insami ganjab international center uh, we talk about is this model or the model fits uh, for everybody if is it possible to have this kind of democracy in different countries um, and, and that's the big question. Then I want to, trans, to transmit this big question that other parts of the world, like China or, or the Arab countries or, uh, other, or in other latitudes, how they are feeling democracy and democracy values. But in our sense, these uh, uh, requirements about free election, uh, uh, freedom of expression, and uh, the division between the different powers, because we have to, to have like a balance between the powers to call it a democracy is uh, really very important. Thank you. Thank you. Alec, would you like to uh, pick up from there? Oh, yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you, Madam uh, President, for the opening remark. It's a great honor to be here uh, with you guys. So when we talk about democracy, uh, for I, I feel for those who are born into liberal democracies, it's easy to consider it um, a goal successfully achieved until we see many negative outcomes from our political systems. For example, nowadays we're seeing the rise of populism, we're seeing extremism within the U.S., we're seeing severe gridlock within the government, ineffective policymaking. And we, when we compare that to some non-democratic countries that seems to have um, more effective ways to enact policies or maintain order, uh, stimulate economic growth, it prompts some of us to wonder a fundamental question, which is, is democracy indeed desirable? And I would like to argue on my part that it is. Democracy is uh, indeed desirable, even though 
the democratic process could be messy because it underlies the value, uh, the values of equality and fairness for individuals. Um, but that being said, one democratic system is different from another, and it could range widely from a highly effective liberal democracy to an illiberal democracy where the votings are mere formalities and people don't really get representation. So that's really why we have the description of this panel. How do we define, achieve, and maintain a good working democracy? I think in order to answer that question, we have to first have an honest assessment of how our uh, the state of our democratic system is like, uh, depending on which country you are in, and, and uh, identify the factors that are contributing, or more importantly, undermining its wellness. We have to not only know what to demand from our government and politicians, but equally importantly, what the responsibilities are for us as everyday citizens. So th these are various angles I love to contribute into today's discussion. But just fast forward, um, I'd like to arrive at the conclusion that uh, democracy is a continuously active process that would require the public to be informed, to be engaged, and to participate. It would demand the government structure to adapt to modern changes and both state and non-state institutions to develop and flourish to create the checks and balances needed for a democratic system. I think that also ties into what Madam President uh, were, were starting to talk about, how if it's possible to cultivate democracy in different cultures. I'd love to pick up on that later as well. So I guess in short, democracy takes work and it's not a destination. So I love to uh, exchange ideas with everyone here. Look forward to it. Thank you. Great. That's really great. Very helpful. Um, I'm going to actually move to Andrew next because I think that uh, this is a perfect segue to the topics that we were talking about offline, the idea of um, uh, democracy and how what this means in the context of citizenship and being an American or being a, a national of any country. Uh, thank you very much. And yeah, I briefly want to riff on uh, Mr. Wang's comments. Um, particularly during the 1980s, there was a foreign policy belief that democracy and kind of Western style capitalism were intermixed as a cohesive unit. And that as the Chinese people became more prosperous, democracy would flourish in that country as um, a middle class grew and they would demand political freedoms. However, China has actually created a, a counter model to democracy and that you can be prosperous. And then the Chinese actually have brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty into the most prosperous they've ever been through a very anti-democratic model. And that opened up, I think, kind of a tendency worldwide where now you have authoritarians who are being elected with the democratic process. And, but once they're elected, the kind of populist, uh, I guess, model of governing is just to remain in power. So you saw this with Venezuela, where Chavez was elected, uh, Hungary, Turkey. So there is kind of a, a countervening model of authoritarianism that's brought through democratic processes. And then, of course, this brings us to contemporary politics in the United States, uh, where you now have basically two entrenched parties that aren't actually doing much in terms of a national plan to move forward. What they've both done is kind of dig down into social issues and a type of tribalism, right? So... We're not really Americans anymore. We're either on the left or the right, and the citizens are very much existentially against each other, which is a, a new turn. And as we look towards our future as Americans, is our democracy a more authoritarian model um, because people have kind of given up on the government being responsive? And so kind of to the broader points of this panel, um, I would say that the path to success would be to have publicly funded elections where you remove private interest, or even if you look at the ascension of Trump, he was given massive TV time before people took him seriously. And this was worth billions of dollars that a conventional politician would have had to fundraise themselves through kind of the process of, you know, seeking favors through oligarchs and things like that. But just the process of TV ratings generating revenue kind of maligned the entire ideal of a democrat process so I think at the, the end solution would be to have publicly funded elections and then you remove kind of the various special interests or, you know, elite interests that have maligned this because the tendency now is to have authoritarians come to power through democratic means. And then once the authoritarian is in power, the kind of personality cult erodes established 
uh, public institutions that were necessary to maintain a democracy. And we're at a new time in kind of the recent human history for all this. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, so um, it raises some issues. One is Citizens United, the Supreme Court case, right. which allowed uh, uh, speech to be represented by money, right? And and the other thing is the, um, uh, you said, sorry, something else. Um, sorry, I had it and I lost it. Sorry. Uh, anyway, but I was just sort of, uh, oh, I know, uh, on the tax forms, uh, when we pay our taxes every year, you can check a box to give $3 to the presidential um, election fund, which doesn't cost you any money at all, but somehow that money gets allocated towards elections. So you're suggesting we maybe take that on a national scale and do that for state elections and stuff too. Uh, yeah, you just re- you remove private influence that way. Because politicians have to seek private influence to remain relevant. So the it's not like there's a choice. This is just the design of the system. Um, but yeah, if it's publicly funded, uh, the French have a model of this, uh, various countries around the world do it. Um, then you don't have these like two out two year long media campaigns with all these odd embedded fiscal interests, and you don't have to like worry about social media. How do you regulate it? Blah blah blah. Um, because it would be uh, compartmentalized into you know like a six week election where kind of like high school popularity contest. I like these things. These are the problems, uh, and then you you do it. But the current system is like saturating American society with kind of like mutual hatred and. Uh, an unresponsive federal government, obviously, right? Mm-hmm. Samantha, would you like to chime in? You look like you might have wanted to comment on something there. Um, I'm really appreciating um, the comments from my uh, fellow, fellow panelists. I picked up, sorry, I'm looking to the left because I took notes. I picked up um, uh, talking about uh, how the public is informed, engaged, and um, need, needing to participate in an effective democracy. And I think um, to take number one, um, the public needs to be informed. Um, as a prerequisite for an effective democracy, I feel like the public really needs to be educated and aware of other uh, other countries, other cultures. And that's a really challenging thing, how we educate our public. Um, and on number three, how do we participate? How do we have proper representation? How do we um, capture the diversity of our population? Um, so I'm also really interested in the tribalism comment. I feel like, um, especially where, where, where I live in America, um, that's, that's a huge issue for us right now. With my work, um, I, I run a nonprofit. We've been helping people evacuate from Ukraine. And um, earlier, we were helping people evacuate from Afghanistan. And so um, if you look at some of these um, more extreme situations, I think that's also really interesting and we can learn from them. Great, great. Uh, Mr. Tang is at the airport in Sao Paulo. Um, the, the connection wasn't so terrific, but maybe he'll try again. Would you like to make some comments, Mr. Tang? Yeah, I think that uh, democracy is certainly one of the best systems that has ever been invented. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not a very perfect system. The uh, system that democracy works best in the Scandinavian countries today, I think. Uh, in the United States, as uh, Andrew very well pointed out, you know, th- there are two opposing camps of America. One very much, you know, very angry at the other. And uh, it's quite dysfunctional where you have several multi, multi billionaires and you have a, a lot of people sleeping on the streets. Now, uh, in my last, you know, I gave an interview to BBC World TV where the uh, reporter, Humphrey Hawksley, was so shocked by what I said that he wrote a book and it can be purchased on amazon.com and the book is democracy killed because i told him that since then xiaoping the uh, successive presidents of china since then xiaoping government of china have succeeded in achieving the greatest feat of human rights in the history of mankind He, of course, was very shocked by what I said because the West keeps on dumping on China because of human rights. But I believe that the basic essence of human rights is to to allow a person, human being, to have a minimum degree of dignity, of human dignity, uh, which is basically 
a plate of food every day and, and a roof over their head. And as they do very well pointed out, China has lifted over 700 million people out of misery. Uh, also, hundreds of millions of Africans. In my last, uh, I was a keynote speaker at Oxford University, and the last time I, I was there, I said that uh, the, Afri the colonial masters siphoned off a lot of the riches of the continent and left Africa as a lost continent for many decades until China started investing massively into the infrastructure of most of the countries of the continent. And infrastructure is the basis of development and prosperity. And now, and transform Africa into a continent of hope. Where if you take a look at the GDP numbers in the last decade, some of the fastest growing countries were countries which China invested massively into the infrastructure of these countries. Now, is the, what is the end of democracy? Or what is the end of every government? Okay, I believe that the end of every government is to afford to create happiness and prosperity for its people. Well, if this is what government is supposed to do, then I believe that China has done a great job. Now, of course, you know, in terms of individual freedom, you know, I live in China also. And you know, aside from the pain, pain in the neck of having to use a VPN, you know, I, I, I'm often, dozens of times a year, I'm interviewed by CGTN, China Global Television Network, which has an audience of more than 500 million people around the world, the English program. And I write many articles for the official newspapers in China. And nobody has ever told me what I can say or not say. And nobody has ever, you know, uh, written anything that I didn't want written. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's where I am. Great. Thank you. Andrew or Alex, do you want to talk about uh, these government goals of happiness and prosperity for the people? Is that a reasonable uh, task list for government? You, you can have prosperity in a dictatorship, but you, that doesn't make it democracy. But, but we're discussing democracy. Um, but yes, the, the Chinese government has had a remarkable record of bringing people out of poverty over the past 70 years. Um, it's a separate issue, I think. It's not a democratic government. In, I, I want to, to add something, if you allow me. I think that there are two big cancers against democracy. One is corruption, and it depends a lot about how the, it's the founding for political campaigns. Especially here in Latin America, if you see what's happening with most of the governments, leftist or in the right uh, side or populist, the big problem is how they fin finance the, the campaigns. And after that, how they pay to the, to the supporters. Uh, because when they arrive to the, to the political uh, um, places like president or vice president or even at the, at the parliament, uh, they pay for the favors and that the corruption is a big cancer. The other big cancer is poverty, inequality, as uh, uh, some of you said, because if you have uh, very wealthy people and people that they don't have, not even for food, not even for shelter, not even for everything, for dreaming, it is terrible. Uh, I, I work a lot with the universities and I was uh, last... Uh, last uh, week in one in university of the central part of the country. And I asked the students, because we were talking about many things, and I asked them, uh, uh, please raise the hand, the people that feel that the country has some good future, our country, Ecuador. And it was like 300 students, university students, and only three raised the hand. When I asked them about how do you feel about the future future of the complete uh, 
planet of the humanity, no one raised the hand, no one, because they don't believe, they don't feel that uh, the, the situation is going to improve. When I ask them what, what uh, some of you want to leave the country to go to other places, most of them raise the hand because they want to move, to have some hope, to, so, home, some solidarity. Then I strongly believe that we have to be more creative to feel, to renew the democracy, maybe starting like from the local conception, not the global, the local conception, the mix between the global issues, uh, because we are in a globe, we have intercommunication, the science, economy, everything determined that we are in a global, uh, global um, uh, territory in the global earth, but the local, the local is very important. How you feel about your identity, about your religion, the way you behave, the, the food, everything. Then if we mix the concepts local and local and build a new world, but not only a new world, but a new concept about global, maybe we can start to feel more creative and how to improve the quality of living of the people. Remember, when, when it was the, the Arab Spring, everybody was like wait, waiting. It's going to change uh, Arab, the Arab countries. And now many of the Arab countries are longing, are thinking that they were better than the Spring, uh, uh, the Arab Spring comes. Then uh, we have to rethink democracy. We have to, we have to rethink about the founding of, of the of the political campaigns and the what's happening with inequality, the access to good quality of life. I want to just take a moment to talk about the corruption issue that you raised. I was very proud to be part of an anti-corrupt government over in what was then called the Republic of Macedonia from 06 to 08. Our Transparency International score, the famous uh, Corruption Perceptions Index, was somewhere around 104, 106 when I started. And we got it down to 62 in two years. Um, it, uh, sadly, it's not there today, but that was already 15 you know, years ago now. Um, more, actually. And um, But one of the ways we did it was we were using this uh, uh, World Bank, what they call it, um, doing business report. I'm sure the president's familiar with this. And trying to figure out how we could become more competitive with the world's countries. The report has now been... Um, uh, stop, unfortunately, for, for, for different reasons, but um, it was very useful back in the day. And it used to take, for example, 42 days for someone to create a new company in Macedonia. And um, I kept cutting and shaving away at that, the requirements to open up a new company. And we got it down to four hours on level with Singapore and New Zealand. And uh, we held, we actually held the number one rank uh, for a bit there as well. So um, because if you reduce... The requirements of government, you reduce opportunities for corrupted behavior. I think that was really the core message I wanted to say. Um, who would like to talk next? So since uh, both Madam President and uh, Andrew mentioned the issue of uh, campaign funding and how politicians are funded, I do want to resonate my agreement because I think that's one of the fundamental uh, issues. I mean, I'll talk about this from a U.S. perspective, like Andrew did, because I'm from here. I think, obviously, there are numerous things here in the U.S. we need to do to improve democracy. But first and foremost, campaign funding structure ties directly to what the politicians are incentivized to do and who they represent. On a national level, you know, we keep hearing a Congress is not representing people anymore. They're passing or killing bills with seemingly uh, disregard of what the everyday people want. And I think there's a clear reason for that. Uh, when we look at the money, follow the money um, on national campaigns, like Andrew mentioned, they've become long drawn out affairs that starts years ahead of time, years ahead of the election. Much of that has to do with fundraising because it's largely funded by private donations. And uh, that really, um, that really ties into who have the influence to um, that the, the, the candidates have to appeal to. You know, even though on election day, most um, say all the qualified citizens can vote, um, technically can vote, and we're not getting into the voter access restriction issues here yet. Um, who they're voting for really is a list of candidates that are already selected and presented to the voters by 
donors because without appealing to donors, a candidate simply cannot go very far. So that being said, since economic elites and special interest groups make outsized donations to, to campaigns with, I think, a few hundred, four or five hundred families in the U.S. contributing up to 50 percent of campaign financing, it's not surprising that the preferences of these two groups, economic elites and special interest groups, have outsized influence in policymaking. So, and meanwhile, I'm quoting a 2014 Princeton study, Princeton University study, the preference of an average American seemed to have a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-important impact on policymaking. So obviously, that's not very democratic practice. So I agree with Andrew very much. Um, if we are able to develop a public uh, funding system and really curb unlimited donation from corporations, super PACs, and really realign what um, our elected officials' uh, incentives are uh, to our constituents. And instead of having candidates more or less pre-selected by a, a tiny amount of the population. And that really is um, a foundational issue to address um, in order to cover many other issues, whether it's climate issues, uh, you know, abortion, labor rights, inequality, because they, re they require passing the right policies. And without having the people reflecting people's wills, they will not pass the right policies that benefits the larger group. So I just want to resonate um, with that and see uh, the campaign finance issue. Thanks. Thank you. I think that most of the large donations are not really donations. People make investments and they expect mm -hmm. a return. Huh. Okay. So I would, I, I never say, I mean, when you go, donate $5 or $10, that's a donation. But when you talk about big donations, nobody makes a big donation. People make big investments and they expect to have a return from their candidate if they win. <laughs> Excuse me. And it's interesting that way, if, if I may jump right back in for a quick comment. It's interesting because... Because exactly that reason, it seems like it's more, it's easier to raise money for the side that advocates for, you know, business deregulation, advocates for lower taxes, because it's more of an immediate financial return compared to if you donate large amounts for the greater good, for funding the poor, funding long-term projects, it's more difficult to fund based, based on those. So there seem to be differences in terms of how to fundraise and their people's response and corporations' response. But this is the origin of corruption many times with the investment in politics or in politicians. Right now in Brazil, they say that the people have a choice between a proven corrupt candidate and a small thief, crazy candidate. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I know exactly. Yes. Yeah, and that's one of the weaknesses of a democratic system, because the the guy who promises most, the guy who lies, who is able to lie with, without with a straight face, and the one who lies most and promises most, you know, you don't have to be anything in any profession. You have to go to school. You have to be an engineer. Anybody can be president as long as you can lie and promise and etc. Okay, so that's one problem. In, in some countries like China, you have to go to 20 proofs of cap capability before you, you know, you are promoted according to your achievements. You know. so. hmm. Samantha, do you want to comment on anything you've heard? Um, I think um, I'm also in agreement with the, uh, the two major cancers of uh, poverty and equality and, and the finance. I, I'm actually curious um, about the rest of the panel, if this doesn't derail the topic too much, how you feel about um, transparency in, in uh, cryptocurrency uh, versus uh, traditional currency. Does anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, so, sometimes so, some people talk about how going back in history and think about democracy by lottery 
and people think that it's crazy, maybe for big uh, countries or because in, in the past in, in Athens or, or in other cities of Greece, people can join together in the same place, but we can join together now by internet, but social media, uh, how to think about creativeness, uh, how to elect the people. And some people can say, okay, but if you did it by lottery, putting names inside of a, of a, of a box or what, whatever, and, and having all the, all the concerns and, and care about it. And, and people say, okay, but you can, you can have a, a crazy people, a crazy person, or you can have a non-prepared, or you can have another uh, that is uh, corrupt. But what happens with elections now? What happens with elections? We, we elect crazy persons, we elect thieves, we elect um, jokers, we elect whatever you can imagine. Then probably it doesn't work for big elections, but to a small towns start to think about an, a different process and you eliminate the origin of corruption in founding campaigns. You can eliminate it and, and think how in our neighbor, you know, we can do that. Remember that in the juries, uh, penal juries, the lawyers know it very well. The members of the jury, they are elected by lottery, by lottery, and they decide about the life of the people or of the people who's going to die. Uh, then think about, be creative about, uh, maybe this panel is not the, the, the place, but uh, I, I only want to put some points just to think about. I actually think that's really interesting, especially the idea that I could um, retain my anonymity and place my vote. I feel in a lot of situations, um, even uh, even in the States, I'm not truly maintaining my anonymity. I go to the polling, everybody knows me. They are, uh, you know, that's, it would be really interesting to vote online. Uh, Estonia has a lot of good digital tools um, for this. I think the issue of mm. cryptocurrency itself, um, yeah, you can, I mean, yeah, it's meant to be a decentralized a governmental entity, but Estonia has healthcare and a lot of their democratic processes as an all digital workflow. And they've had to deal with Russia on their border um, doing antagonistic things. So yeah, for looking for these kind of transparency models on the blockchain and things like that, Estonia is, I, to my knowledge, the, the world. <laughs> it is indeed, it is indeed. I hope you don't have a big uh, position in, in uh, cryptocurrencies right now. Oh, I do. I'm very against cryptocurrency. I feel like blockchain is incinerating our environment, and I'm incredibly uh, negative against it. I feel it's awful. Interesting. Um, let me go to our, our audience. Uh, Mr. Jim Wan, partner at Joyview Education, has the following question for the panel. How would one define, quote, democracy, unquote, exactly? It's an often thrown around buzzword used by all sorts of interest groups and something everyone claims to be, as they claim to be democratic. What metrics qualify um, a, a country as democratic uh, or, or not? Uh, well, I, I started saying that democracy, uh, we can define it like in a, in a system where you elect, you have free elections, access to elections. You have the balance between powers. Uh, it's very important because if you have a president that's going through the legislative and imposing, or uh, even worse, to the judiciary. It is terrible, and it happens in many countries where the presidents put the hands on the justice, and this, this is not a democracy. The other is uh, freedom of expression. I think there are some parameters. Uh, they are not the only ones, and probably they are imperfect, but they define democracy. I think... Um... When most of us talk about democracy here, we mean liberal democracy, where don't we, where we don't just have an electoral system, but actually have also individual liberty, economic and religious liberty, like Madam President said, freedom of speech, uh, independent media, functioning government, private property rights, etc. And if if we connect that with something else we were talking about at the beginning, I think. If we look at places that successfully evolved into liberal democracies, um, two factors seem to m play important roles. One is uh, building effective and stable institutions, and the other one is economic development. So if you have one uh, without the other, 
it it cannot it's it could be like an illiberal democracy and that's partially why um you know for a lot of third world countries that declare themselves to be democracies after gaining independence if they remain poor uh, without um economic development or stable institutions they become dictatorships within a decade or so and and we have to clarify that uh, economic development here is not the same as having money alone because many countries that are blessed with having abundant natural resources actually could fall into natural resource traps where um the easy money obtainable by the government actually hinders the the establishment of rule of law and uh, and political institutions um that's my two cents yeah well you know democracy by the people from the people and for a small percentage of the people is what we really have okay rather than for the people all right uh and i think that you know uh, the herd mentality in the media is, is you know, people basically everybody says the same thing all the media says the same thing you don't hear any dissenting voices uh, concerning for example the the war now between you know of course everybody has to condemn destruction war and uh, you know suffering but nobody there is not one media that says that that talks about why this war started perhaps if zelensky had agreed to become a neutral country or not join nato before the war started maybe we wouldn't have had them we wouldn't have a war and people say that zelensky the ukraine will win but what kind of victory is it when you have your country destroyed and when you have 6-15% of your population as refugees now, of course i condemn the war of course i'm against the war and destruction and suffering nobody in their right mind can support the war okay but on the other hand like i you know uh, speak by uh, we i'm in a group of uh, china investment group basically 40 business people invest in china and one of the speakers was admiral owens the owens who was the leader who was number one you know of the us fleet okay admiral owens was a brilliant commander of the us navy and he said that, you know nato was not supposed to have expanded to 30 countries there are written agreements that it wouldn't do that and if you surround putin you're going to get he's going to react and like putin said can you imagine if he installed missiles in cuba and venezuela the us you know we had that before with between kennedy and khrushchev you know we almost have a nuclear war so i think that the media should be let's say more diversified rather than a herd mentality media thank you um I want to uh, address something Mr. Tang said about NATO for the benefit of people who are not that familiar with how it works. Um I uh, other than the, the obvious stuff in the media, uh NATO will not admit a country that is not in full territorial control of its borders. So um because uh Russia had already taken um uh, Crimea and Yalta in 2014 because they invaded Georgia and took over Abkhazia and South Ossetia in 2008. and you have this uh region of Moldova called Transnistria um which is also russian controlled uh these three countries which border russia can never um uh join nato by definition so his invasion was predicated on false false statements um i would just want to make that point so people understand that uh this was never an issue for uh the, he wanted to have a buffer right but he had that by creating by creating this cold conflict so he didn't need to uh invade to do that further but it's it's in the ukrainian constitution what is to join nato well yeah okay except that <laughs> they can't do it as long as they don't control their borders so fine okay um samantha has some interesting 
um, thoughts about democracy in the context of uh, today's digital world, specifically with digital identity. I thought I'd give her a few minutes to, uh, to speak about that. It actually ties into what you just said. I think um, I agree with you about the herd mentality in media. And, um, and we were talking earlier about campaign finance. I feel like we have to look at how um, media and news are incentivized. Um, and that's really tied to ads in our modern digital world. And so I was wondering from the rest of you, if we, if we were able to decouple ads and news, how do you think that would change? Do you think that would uh, help us uh, move towards achieving democracy? It would be of service, but again, I think if you have publicly funded elections, then that whole marketplace doesn't exist to begin with. Um, and then you don't have to deal with the, the weird policy issues of social media versus legacy media um, versus broadcast TV and um, dealing with government censorship. And because people aren't going to take on that issue with like a sincere civic mindedness, right? People try to skirt any type of regulation. So I do think by just eliminating the, the marketplace for media corruption of elections by making the elections publicly funded, it'll go a great way towards the, those reforms and achieving those objectives. Uh, I think that we must pay attention to another factor that it's education, how we are educating the, educating the young people. And uh, I, I uh, mean the quality education and the values that we want to transmit to the next generations. Uh, because there's a, there's a lot of information in social media and internet, but uh, not the, the kind of information that is uh, really valid to, to create most democratic states, uh, more uh, equality, more hope uh, in, in young people. Then uh, the government have to think in uh, education like the best investment that the governments can make. And uh, I had been an educator most of my life, and I strongly believe that if we don't invest in education, and I'm talking not only about Latin America, I'm talking about U.S., I'm talking about the different countries, we must uh, talk about the values in education and to, to improve the quality and make it uh, available for everybody, not only for, for an elite, like is happening in, in most of the countries, having quality education and uh, talking about values and things like that. Thank you. Anybody else would like to make some final comments? We're about two minutes left. Well, it's great to talk about uh, democracy, the democracy and values uh, during these uh, minutes. and. Uh, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to listen different points of view from uh, different parts of the world. And uh, I think we, we must continue dialoguing and talking about how to a strong democracy in our countries. Here, here. I also, you, you opened your comments by talking about the Library of Alexandria. The director is an amazing human being, absolutely yes. incredible I, person. And then GIC, which I've been to as well back in 2015. Well, it was a great pleasure to be able to join all you guys in the, this conference. And I think that uh, hopefully we can build a better democracy. That's great. Thank you. Have a safe trip, Mr. Tang. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And bye bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Oops, trying to turn this off here. here.